on webcast1live.com. The Legislative Hour with your hosts, Bart Smith and Kevin Hall. And good afternoon and welcome to the Iowa Legislative Hour. I am Kevin Hall and the illustrious Art Smith is back with us this week. Art, great to see you. It's nice to be here. Kevin, I uh, I don't know if you noticed the little uh, message I sent you as I was driving down here for uh, for our show. You probably didn't. Did you see it? You didn't see it. So I, I was wanted to let you know I was on my way. Mm-hmm. Right. So I, I sent that message out, except I typed, I'm I'm in my way. <laughs> I looked and I said, oh, boy, I better change that. <laughs> it's kind of hard to but do, be in I your own the, way. I may, yeah. <laughs> well, not for me. Well, right. <laughs> Moving on, yeah, we have some great guests in the studio this week. Uh, Jake Heifel, who has uh, become a regular on the show, representative from Johnston. Jake, it's good to see you again. Thanks, Kevin. And a new visitor to the show this week from Oskaloosa, Representative Guy Vanderlinden. Guy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Uh, first off, let's just... Uh, is he? Is his microphone working? I don't think it was on that time. Just say hi. Say something again. Hi. Okay. Now right. we got you. <laughs> yep, I heard that. <laughs> Just give us a little bit of your background. Uh, you know, you this is your you're now in your second term in the legislature. That's right. Yeah. Tell us just a little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, I was born and raised in Oskaloosa. Graduated from the University of Iowa. Went straight into the Marine Corps. Spent 30 years doing that. A uh, little bit of time after graduation from the Marine Corps in the aviation industry, and then I moved back to Iowa about six years ago, and. As you mentioned, in 2010, uh, a neighbor asked if I was interested in running for the mm-hmm. legislature. Long story short, I ended up running, and here we are. We're glad to have you. And, Jake, I know you have a lot of respect for this guy. I, I do. And I only call him general because I think it's a diss to call him representative. <laughs> so it's a knockdown. So I only call him general. <laughs> so just kind of tell us, and I know it's been a very slow week, and today the House, did you guys just gavel in and gavel out? Was that pretty much the gist of it? Uh, that's pretty much the gist of it. But actually, there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Okay. A lot of conference committees are getting together now. Mm-hmm. Uh, education's been in se- in session for probably a couple of weeks. That's kind of a sad story. Yeah. Um, I'm on the admin uh, the uh, admin and reg budget sub. We met for the second time today, and that's virtually done, I think. Uh, and I heard coming over here that we're actually going to get the property tax to uh, a conference committee, and that's hmm. the biggest progress on property tax since I've been in the legislature. So that was really good news. And this is something that they've batted around. Even when you were campaigning in 2010, they were talking about, well, we need property tax reform. Governor Branstead campaigned on that. So, yep. I, it, you know, do you think, are you hearing that something might actually get accomplished this year? Uh, it, until I heard that it was going to conference committee, I didn't think it had a chance. Mm-hmm. But th- this is very, very encouraging. I, I, I hope that we can actually get a few sane people at the table and get something done. Uh, Jake, it seems like every week we're talking about the education reform here on this show. And, uh, you know, see, there were whispers that there's some progress being made. What are you hearing on the Capitol floor? When, when it comes to the education, I think it's going to happen. There's no way the Democrats are going to turn that down that kind of money because they love the money we talked about last week. They All they want is the money. They don't want the solution to the problem. They just want the money. So I really do think that it's going to happen. And we're staying, our Ron Jorgensen and Cecil Dolchek are staying very, very strong. The fact that if you don't take our language, you'll have 0% level growth or supplemental state aid as we call it now. Hmm. It's, our new, it's our new term for it. So if we don't have that, the schools will have zero, but all my administrators are on board. Everybody's on board. They <clears> want this. They want this to pass, you know, two months ago. So hopefully when the school board's on board and the schools are on board, that makes the Republicans look well in education, which doesn't happen very often, as you know. <laughs> mm-hmm. But the channel, the challenge being that the Democrats aren't going to want the Republicans looking good on this, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the bottom line is, is that they're going to need to score some political points in the midst of this before it can move forward. Mm-hmm. Now, you'd think that they scored enough by getting – getting the money, but I don't think you realize how hard it is to get our Republican caucus, the 4% allowable growth. Right. That, that's not no easy task mm-hmm. at all. Yep. Our members are very op- optimistic. And if we don't have those amendments that we have, it won't happen. We don't have the votes to pass it out of there. And people are very open about that too. Mm-hmm. With the superintendents and the school boards on board, uh, I think they're they're probably taking a lot more criticism than they are getting credit for anything. They may just want to stop the pain. That would be yeah. my hope. Yeah. And I, I'm telling everybody in education, 
that this is a good deal. Mm -hmm. and, and they recognize that. So, yeah. so I think we, we may get this one done. Good. Okay. And just to refresh people's memories, uh, talk a little bit about allowable growth and what exactly that is for people who may not understand it. Well, uh, allowable growth is what the legislature allows school boards to raise the, in essence, taxes. It always goes to property taxes to get an additional 4% of mm -hmm. revenue to hire teachers or do whatever uh, schools need to do. This bill would at least partially help. Uh, we're going to give them 4% growth, but it's not going to go to property taxes. The okay. state's actually going to provide some revenue for this, mm -hmm. uh, help uh, in a big way with the schools particularly. So um, I, I think it's a step in the right direction. And, and as Jake pointed out, we're, we're calling it state's supplemental state aid, which mm -hmm. is what it really is, mm -hmm. uh, rather than allowing property taxes to go up. So. And originally, uh, the, Senate said, <clears throat> the Senate Democrats had offered 4%. You gentlemen in the House, uh, the Republican side had offered 2%. You agreed to a bargain, said, hey, we'll go up to 4%. If you agree to our reforms, because that's what they demanded over and over and over. That's right. Give us the money. Yep. You agreed to it, and now they're backtracking on that. Right. And Cor <laughs> Kornbach went on his little rant lying about that. I don't know if we talked about that last week or not, but he <clears> went <throat> off saying, I didn't say that. We have him on the governor's website with the YouTube clip, <laughs> and they made a little about him saying it over and over and over uh -huh. again. We gave him the 4% and it's there. Especially in my district, as you know, Grimes is growing like crazy. Yes. Johnson's growing like crazy. Mm -hmm. Non-time funding's not there. So every year we actually lose money because those students come in, say we'll get 300 new students. We don't. It's not on-time funding. So the allowable growth keeps us just barely par because mm -hmm. of how many kids we get every year. The interesting but, thing is the only, re I mean, I know that there was some kind of video response, which I never saw, but the only, you know, response I'm seeing on Facebook and such from from folks on the left to, to the governor's video is, that's all they have time to do is is, is make those videos. <laughs> it's like, if it gets the point across, yeah, I mean I, that's it's messaging. Yeah, I mean, it, and it did. It got yep. it got the point across. Absolutely. So absolutely. Uh, so what else is going on this week at the Capitol? I know uh, there was debate. Well, you, of course, the Health and Human Services budget, which is it's ca it came monstrous. over. Yeah, it came over. Uh, we haven't done anything with it yet. We're going to run it in appropriations Monday about three o'clock. We're going to do a strike after amendment in appropriations. We're going to basically take out all their language and put our budget in there. Because as you can imagine, they're not even what 107% of what we have. They're spending way more than we take mm -hmm. in, and then we, which is our number one principle. I know it's so hard for people to say this, but we don't spend more than we have. I, I know it's a crazy thought, but you got to explain that to some people. Yeah. So yeah. We, we have a target. We're not going to go over that target under any condition. We'll be here as long as we have to be. But there's a target. We'll, we'll, we'll meet in the middle if we have to, but... We will not spend more than we take in. That's it. So we're going to strike after a minute and put our budget in there. And that's going to, as you know, it's a very, very interesting budget. Yes. Uh, this is my first term. And I've already heard more about that in the last little bit for taxpayer bonded abortions in mm -hmm. University of Iowa and mm -hmm. Planned Parenthood. So I know it won't happen in our budget. So I go to conference committee and hopefully this will be the year we figure that out. That's a big thing. I think it's a step in the right direction for everybody and we might actually have a few Democrats on both sides supporting that, too. Joe Singh was the one Democrat on the Senate side um, from Davenport who supported it. Uh, it was Amy Sinclair, a freshman senator from Allerton down in southern Iowa, who offered the amendment last week. And uh, it was shot down narrowly on party lines, one crossover being Joe Singh. Uh, of course, then you had the family leader rallying at the Capitol on mm -hmm. Monday, uh, you know, saying, let's stop taxpayer-funded abortions. That's all we're asking. You know, stop the taxpayer. Fund. Is is this something that has a chance of finally going through this year? What do you guys think? It'll sail through the House. Yeah, uh, it, it's a matter of what happens in conference committee. Um, I, it it might have a chance. I'm I'm hopeful. Yeah, I think it does, and uh, I really think it does this year because people are understanding that even if you are a pro abortion, whatever you want to call it, pro choice that you still don't believe people should pay for your own stuff. Right. You shouldn't mm -hmm. have the state paying for what you do. Right. And everything, all your healthcare decisions. And so that's a big step we're going to try to win here. And hopefully we can go in that direction. Of course, we have very strong people in our caucus because that will not vote for it regardless. So we have to do something to meet in the middle and get common ground and understand that we can't fund that. Also, uh, Representative Ab Abdul Samad. Samad. AKO Abdul Samad, uh, yeah. AKO. Mm -hmm. uh, he... 
will probably vote with us. He he's thought about it. We talked to him before. He is also very pro life. So hopefully we'll have a few members hmm. in the house too that will switch over to. I was side. not aware of that. I've talked that's, to him about it. It is he, interesting. <clears throat> it's good to know. It really is. Mm-hmm. I think we can get him to switch over and vote with us this time. We talked about it. I can't remember what committee we talked about it with him. He's also pro life. He's mm-hmm. you know not the number one issue obviously, but he's personally pro life. So hopefully we can get him to switch over with us on that. Very good. Um, one of the biggest things I think going, I was there earlier today at the Capitol and it just seemed kind of dead. Nobody, you know, nothing going on in the house. Um, the NRA president, David Keene did drop. I don't know if either of you guys were, I was or, there. you were there. Mm-hmm. What did you think about what he had to say? Uh, I was very impressed with him as a, an individual and mm-hmm. a speaker. Um, very knowledgeable, uh, very articulate. Yes. Uh, and I thought he made some excellent points. Um, about the way the NRA is is handling its business, that they are, he he addressed the issue of of the NRA buying votes and all that, and and in fact they are not. Yeah, they're uh, being outspent by Bloomberg and the right. liberals and yeah, uh, and they've been accused of getting money from gun makers and so forth, and only four percent of their right. income comes from uh, gun manufacturers. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. Uh, I was very impressed. I thought he did a good job. I, I hope the word gets out that that was what was going on, not this tiny little protest that was going on out in the hall. <laughs> Although the, those 10 people will get plenty of publicity <laughs> as opposed to the, you know, Mr. Keene and the 125 people who are in there to, to hear him speak. I'm sure the, the 10 protesters will, will get plenty of publicity. Um, but yeah, he was a very interesting guy. I know he was doing the rounds meeting with uh, the top officials in the state uh, today at the Capitol and, um, of course, Jake, you know, last week, the Senate Democrats are big and President Obama's big push on restricting gun rights. It was shot down. Uh, actually, I'm happy it came to a vote so people know where people stand. Mm-hmm. I, I don't like it when it, for a big vote like that at the federal level. I don't want to see it die in conference committee or something right. like that. I'm glad it came to a vote. I'm glad Senator Grassley stood up for us and said, no, we're not doing this. Mm-hmm. He, we don't mind reasonable. He doesn't mind reasonable checks. But when it comes to this and. For example, if I sold a gun to the general, it would be against the law if I didn't report that. Right. Background check, which is, you know, friends or my father gives me a gun when he dies, I'm in his role. That's against the law under this new bill. So that was a little ridiculous. Getting somebody in trouble for something that you didn't report between family members and friends, that's yeah, mm-hmm. it's a little out there. Yeah. I think the best part about that was that it failed in the Senate with Democrat votes. Yes. yes. Yeah. Because the I think that the strategy was get it through the Senate and make the nasty Republicans in the mm-hmm. House responsible for killing this gun right. control bill. So right. I, that was very fortunate. I yes, think. it was. What does that say about President Obama's ability and, you know, his political capital if he can't even get all the Democrats on his side for a vote that's, you know, that they've been playing up for months and months and tried to make it, you know, this emotional thing after the Newtown massacre? I I think that may be the president's biggest weakness mm-hmm. is that he is incapable of building coalitions to get his agenda done. Mm-hmm. And this is a prime example mm-hmm. because he pulled out all the stops uh, publicly yeah. touring the country, bringing in witnesses or uh, mm-hmm. you know advocates and so mm-hmm. forth, and he still couldn't get it done. Yeah. Uh, that that doesn't speak very well for him, I don't think. And Jake, you know, I don't know if you paid a bunch of attention to politics in two thousand eight. You're <clears throat> a little little younger. I was then. in high school. Yeah, you were. Yeah, <laughs> still a teenager. Um, you know, in two thousand eight, all he talked about is how he was going to bring everybody together, and we're all going to sing Kumbaya, and the world's going to love us. And you know, he, his ability to work across the aisle has been abysmal. It's been, in, especially if you follow him. I follow him on Twitter, obviously. And I've all he talks about every five minutes: guns, guns. He doesn't. He gets. He has a, he's one good at one thing though: getting people off topic of the biggest issue in America. The national debt and mm-hmm. how many jobs he's killing with his debt, how much taxes and regulations he's coming. He gets mm-hmm. people on with their emotions, like any good Democrat does. He'll put it right there and talk about guns only. How many times you talk about national debt? Never. It's always guns and how we can stop these people. And so that's the one thing that he can do. And that's people that don't look into the issue and understand that we need to worry about. Yes, we stop this gun bill. That's great. Now we need to go. What about the national debt? What about the regulations? What well, about maybe his his view on the debt is the same as. Jack Hatches. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I like your article, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for people who, who might not have caught that, uh, just refresh that story for us. Because I, I, I love telling it again because it's yeah. such a great story. No, it was Senator Whitford and uh, Senator Hatch were in the back. And 
Senator Jack Hash, Democrat from Des Moines. And Whitford, as you guys probably know, Jack Whitford from Ankeny. Yep. He, in the back, I was standing there waiting for him to talk to Jack about a different issue, and they were getting into it. And Senator uh, Hatch, we could talk about Medicaid expansion or mm-hmm. not. And he goes, I don't give an F about the federal debt. And I was like, I'm like, oh, all right. And Brad Zahn was sitting there. T- I think he was there too. Yeah. With Senator Whitford. I was like, well, the difference between me and you is I actually care about that. It's probably why I ran for a. Wow. Know, yeah. Make sure to keep our. I love it. Well, one, I mean, what, fundamentally, one of the, one of the biggest fallacies of how we operate as a government is, if if we think that government at a certain level can't afford to pay for its own stuff, then we reach up to the next level of government to cover that stuff for everybody. I know. And I find it I find it frustrating, even when it comes to to schools. OK, you know, we, we go ahead and fund at the state level. We fund a tremendous amount of money for schools for all the districts, regardless of how much money and resources they have to pay for those things. Now, where is that money coming from? The same people who would be paying for it if they were to fund it locally. And so the thing that it just it kind of drives me crazy that we have this idea that school funding for all school districts should come from the state. Now, I'm I totally get the fact that there are some districts that, you know, lack the resources, they're 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 lower income communities. And, and I'm and I'm totally up for the idea of trying to help some of those out. But this idea that we have to have a system that, you know, we're collecting money from everybody to give back to everybody just and, and we're doing that at the federal level, and that's why we're where we are. And and people who operate at the state level in government, especially Democrats, but even and I've seen some Republicans this way too, have this mindset that they're going to go ahead and uh, you know get what they want, get what they need from the federal government, and are always trying to figure out how to get money to cover Iowa expenses out of states like New York and California and Florida and Alaska, who got their own issues to deal with. Anyway, that's my rant for today. But- <laughs> well said, though. By the way, Kevin, say, speaking of Mayor Bloomberg and doing his anti-gun things, mm-hmm. I don't know if you, I, uh, I have a confession. I watch liberal media sometimes just to know what they're raining about. It's it's good to know what the other side is talking I, about. You ever mm-hmm. heard of the Young Turks? Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I do watch some of their clips on YouTube sometimes. They had one, uh, oh, it was two days ago, about Mayor Bloomberg trying to um, increase the cigarette age to buy cigarettes. Only in New York City, the 21 and after, you know, after he failed on his pop band, he wanted to ban any soda over 22 ounces. And now he's doing that. Guns. It's a, he's a mayor. He's not mm-hmm. like he's the president. We you know we're right. something. He's a mayor. So that's his new target because you know that's so important to. So this taxpayers. is so this is the guy who, by the way, has bought a red truck to run around New York City with a big sign on the side that says, "Guns kill 34 Americans every day." And then behind that truck is another truck that's financed by, a, a, you know, another, you know, a Second Amendment group that says guns saved 2,100 lives every day. <laughs> and it's just it's funny to, to even waste his time running that truck around. That's obviously looks stupid when you see all the facts. I thought uh, David King, going back to the NRA president, he made a good point today. There's this video game out there uh, called the title of it. I think it's Kill David Keene. Right. I, oh. I love how the Ooh. anti-gun people, are, yeah. you know, want to kill the the pro Second Amendment people, or yeah. you know, mo- you know, mock advocating killing. advocating violence. That's, That's what it's doing. <laughs> it's, I don't know. Makes no sense to me. No. The, the hypocrisy is the hypocrisy and the irony is, you know, you, we see it every day now. And it's and it's just amazing. You are watching the Iowa Legislative Hour. Kevin Hall, along with Art Smith, our guest, Representative Jake Heifel, State Representative from Johnston, and Representative Guy Vanderlinden from Oskaloosa. Much more to come. We're going to kind of branch out this week and talk a little bit about national politics and some other things going on around the state when we return on the Iowa Legislative Hour. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. Oh, I brought uh, along a couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I'm administrative manager. I'm the senior technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, 
um, that we're going to do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do. And if we guarantee it's going to be a good experience for you or else it's free, what type of work do you think we're going to do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we'd fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you going to say that to a client? No. <laughs> you don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're going to be listening, they're going to want to know what your challenges are, then they're going to come and give you options and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family, you know you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now and then leave and then come back, charge you again, and, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed today. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me. But is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did is perfect. It's great. <laughs> Keep going, though. I like this. <laughs> Just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do, I mean, fixed rider, it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. And we're back. Uh, welcome to the Iowa Legislative Hour. I'm Art Smith, along with Kevin Hall. And this week we have representatives uh, Jake Heifel from Johnston and Guy Vanderlinden from Oskaloosa. And uh, we've had some good conversations so far about some of the uh, goings on in the state legislature this week. And uh, it is a little bit of a, a drier week, um, but uh, some other things are happening. Uh, that I think are uh, of some value. The uh, the Bush Library is being dedicated this week. Today. And today. Yep. Okay. All and four, um, both Bush, George W. and George H. W. are so there. So they've got all, okay. As is Clinton and President Obama. Oh, wow. So you have the four living presidents are, wow. are all there. That's awesome. That's awesome. Carter's there too, I think. Is he? Oh, yeah, that's right. The other fifth one. <laughs> I, I tend to prefer to forget him. So. Uh, where's where's the library located? Dallas, Texas, uh, Southern Methodist University. Okay, and we've got some state legislators that are actually down yes, there do. as part of the ceremony, correct? Yes, we have two, uh, Mary Ann Nusa from Council Bluffs mm -hmm. and Megan Hess. They both worked uh, at President uh, Bush's, I'm not sure what Megan did. She was younger when she worked for him. Maybe an intern or, intern or uh, something. I can't remember, but Mary was a staffer as well. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they're down there now. Megan's from Spencer, Iowa. Okay. I believe uh, Marianne helped out with um, correspondence, mm -hmm. mail, and, and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I, Representative Vanderlinden, we were um, talking in the break, and you have an interesting story. You actually flew President Reagan in Marine One. Tell us a little bit about that. I did. Um, I was the operations officer of Marine Helicopter Squadron One, and wow. in that capacity, I was one of four pilots at that time who actually flew as pilot in command with the president. And what what years are we talking here? Would have been 1985 to 1988 that wow. I was there. Wow. So how many flights do you think you, you had with him? Uh, if, just I, a rough estimate. I, I actually could look at my logbook. I could oh. tell you the exact <laughs> number, but it wasn't that many. I, I'd say maybe uh, 25, okay. something like wow. that. Okay. What was it like? It was tremendous. Uh, I mean... Just being there, of course, is tremendous. But that particular president was uh, especially kind to us little people, uh, hmm. always thoughtful. Every time he came aboard, he came up in the cockpit, said hello. If you'd been around long enough that, that he'd recognize you, he would call you by name. Uh, same thing when he got off. He'd thank you for, for your service and so forth. They were, he hmm. and his wife were 
genuine people. Hmm. You know, I think that's something that people loved about Reagan is he's, his ability to connect with people was just unseen, I think, in, mm-hmm. in you know, U.S. politics yeah. uh, prior. I mean, Nixon obviously didn't have that characteristic. Right. Carter maybe a little bit, but, you know, Reagan, along with his charisma and, and his great personality, but the ability to connect with people, I, I think, made him really special. Yeah, yeah. and I, it, I saw him do it with everybody that he dealt with in any way whatsoever, whether hmm. it was little old pilots like me or it was the Secretary of State. You could see the same expressions on his face, the same... A uh, way of handling individuals. He was truly a people person. Wow. I, I know this is going to sound like a dumb technical question, but how, how big is that helicopter on the inside? Uh, the helicopter itself <laughs> weighs a little over 20,000 pounds. Okay. It can carry, um, it can actually carry maybe 20 people. Wow. Uh, but we never carried that many. Okay. Um, and it, and and it's because it's been made into a passenger's aircraft. It's right. got tremendous air conditioning, uh, oh, wow. soundproofing. You can carry on a conversation in there, normal conversation in flight. It's, wow. it's as quiet or quieter than an airliner. Wow. Um, so it's not it's not intended to be big people carrier. Sure, it just carries big people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have one question for you, General. So when. Just like Marine or Air Force One, it's only Air Force One when the president's in it. The same thing with Marine One. Yeah. So it's just called what's it called when the uh, president's not in it? Well, you you just have a squadron call sign Nighthawk One or whatever, and then when you land and pick him up, when when you if you can call the tower and say we're coming out of here, then you say it's Marine One is okay. lifting, and 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 it definitely makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck the first time you get to say that. Yeah. Wow. You, you know, I, I don't think there's any question. Reagan was the best president of my, my lifetime uh, guy. I'm not going to say you're a little bit older, but I'm, <laughs> it's not a little I, bit, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the best president of your lifetime. Do you think? Uh, yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. Why? I mean, what, what was it about him that, that made him um, and I, still, you know, to this day, I mean, every, Republican candidate who runs for president, they, they all talk about the legacy of Ronald Reagan. Right. Um, I think he was by far the best Republican president, particularly in terms of being able to relate to people, to get people to say, oh, I like this guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then his he had an uncanny ability to sell ideas that were considered to be not particularly popular at the time. Right. Fiscal conservatism, uh, all of that. It, it just came when he when you watched him on TV when he was giving you a presidential address you walked away saying, well yeah why didn't I think of that before <laughs> you know I, he was very persuasive without being uh, overbearing in any way I mm-hmm. I think that was his great strength yeah and obviously had a great ability something that President Obama doesn't have to work across the aisle because with Tip O'Neill you know they worked together and got a lot of things accomplished yeah, together that's. It, that's the popular opinion anyway. Mm-hmm. He certainly could work with people whether they agreed with him or, or not, and, uh, and, and he was persuasive in some way or another. Well, since uh, we mentioned George W. Bush and the dedication of his presidential library today, I, I thought it would be interesting to talk a little bit about the Bush legacy because, I mean, mm-hmm. when he left office, I think his approval rating was 32 33%, yeah. which was the same as Richard Nixon's right. when he was thrown out of office. Mm-hmm. Now it's up to 47%. And I always said all along that history would treat George W. Bush kinder than, yeah. uh, you know, the present day yeah. did. What do you, the Bush legacy, I, I, I'm curious well, to we, get your take on it. We were talking too. a little bit, you know, the last two years of his presidency was was a lot of turmoil. And so obviously between the economy, uh, the the housing bust and uh, the and wars, the wars and the, uh, the uh, hurricane mm-hmm. and uh, Katrina, mm-hmm. Um, there were just you know a number of things that kind of hit hit his office and hit our country hard, um, and obviously you know I think he I think he tried his best to deal with those uh, in the way that he thought best. Um, obviously, I think we all know that you know, in hindsight we feel like there's things that could have been done better, but I think overall, if you look at the history of his presidency, um, his reaction to nine eleven, um, the 
his his stand on military actions and the managing of the military and and dealing with our veterans and um, you know and the fact that he really started to to help us uh, not not just uh, Republicans but I think all of us to think more in terms of how can we make life better for people around us without having to make the government make mm-hmm. life better for those around us um, and I know that that made a slight impact and it takes a long time for those things to really meld into our psyche. And of course now we're kind of in the opposite direction to be quite candid with you. Um, but I, I like that a lot. And I think that if we can, uh, if we can get, if we can get some of that philosophy back, uh, I think it'll be a lot easier to look back at what he did and say, yeah, he was trying to go down the right path. We just, we didn't quite get there, but a lot of good things were accomplished, Mm -hmm. especially during the first six years. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I don't know that any president could have handled those last two years, you know, any much better than, than he did. I mean, in the midst of it. Yeah. And that's always the chance. You know, when you're looking at I know there were days when I was looking at this and I had some money in, in the stock market and there were days when, you know, uh, there were some banking uh, concerns that their stock dropped all the way down to 50 cents yeah. a share. And, uh, you know, the company I work for, Wells Fargo. Uh, their stock dropped from like 35 down to eight. Mm-hmm. And uh, frankly, I think a lot, I, I was nervous myself about what was going to happen. Now, I, I believe things would eventually turn out okay, but I, you know, none of us could sit there in the midst of that and say, it was tough. you know, we can just <laughs> ride this out and it'll be okay. You know, riding it out might end up being, I lose my house for five yeah. years and I'm That's riding right. it out sitting on the street, <laughs> you know? So it was, I think it was a really tough situation and, and, and if anybody thinks that they could have come up with a better plan when this was all happening, I, I'm, I'd be a little bit intrigued to find out wh- what they thought that would be without knowing what actually would, would occur. You mentioned the military aspect, uh, General Vanderland, and just from your point of view, what are your thoughts on the George W. Bush legacy and his, his eight years? Well, my, <clears throat> my personal experience, of course, was with his father mm-hmm. um, in the Gulf War, and the 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 worst I ever saw it in 30 years in the Marine Corps was when Carter was president. Hmm. We reached oh. a real low point. We mm-hmm. had equipment that didn't work. We had equipment. We didn't have equipment uh-huh. that we needed. Uh, ships that, that didn't sail. It was bad. Wow. And uh, Reagan takes some heat for uh, causing indebtedness because he, he very much fixed the Defense Department. Mm-hmm. And uh, H.W. Bush continued that and took us, I think, bravely into a, a war that could have been a disaster. And, and I think uh, uh, George W. Bush had the same philosophy that when we were attacked, uh, we we're going to strike back. Mm-hmm. And we did. Mm-hmm. Uh, the The details of it as things in, unfolded in Iraq or Afghanistan, I think, are immaterial. The point is, those presidents let the world know that if you attack the United States, you will pay. Yes. And I think that strength is absolutely imperative for national security. Uh-huh. The, the would-be enemies of this country need to, need to believe that if they strike, they're going to get hurt worse. Uh-huh. And, and that, is, that goes a long way toward keeping them from ever doing something stupid in the first place. Yep. I saw um, Lanny Davis, who was a close advisor to the Clintons mm-hmm. and a lifelong Democrat, uh, made the point today uh, in a column, I think it was in politico.com, um, that in terms of Iraq and the WMD, you know, the whole narrative is, oh, Bush lied. Well, Davis makes a point that the Clinton White House absolutely believes Saddam Hussein had chemical weapons, Mm -hmm. as did the vast majority of the intelligence community. Yeah, Mm -hmm. and I think you could make a case that those chemical weapons slipped across the border into Iran and Syria. Yes, yes. Which... I'm yeah. still not buying that they weren't there. And today we're finding out that now Chuck Hagel, the new defense secretary, he believes mm-hmm. Syria not only had, but used, but used yes. chemical weapons, mm-hmm. sarin gas, yeah. just recently, yep. Yep. So, which supposedly was President Obama's uh, the re- it was a red, red line. line. Yeah. And yeah. remember that Saddam used them on his own people That's at right. one point. Yes. So he certainly and, had them. And look, I you know <clears> what? <throat> you can you can come up with five different, 10 different, 50 different reasons for either not or going ahead and attacking uh, Saddam Hussein. Um, 
from my standpoint, the fact that he was killing his own people the, the way that he was in mass numbers, um, you know, back in back at the end of World War Two, there was a plaque laid at Auschwitz. I believe it was at Auschwitz that said never again. Hmm. I. And, and I mean, if you've ever been to and really been to a concentration camp and seen the horrors that were committed upon human beings, there's just no way that situations like uh, Iraq and Darfur and, <clears throat> you know, all these places that continue over over these past years to, to have acts of genocide uh, being committed upon their own people. And, and, you know, and we think that we can't do anything about it. I, I just I don't know what we were saying when we said never again. Jake, I'd like to get your take just from a young person's point of view. Uh, you know, most people your age were very anti George Bush. You know, four or five years ago. And I'll tell you something. Uh, Bush's second term was when I was fourteen. Uh, his the very end of his term, I, I was seventeen and I caucused. Actually, it's kind of weird because I'm not that way anymore. But I caucus. I'm actually seventeen. But you could, if you're eighteen by the election, you can right. caucus. Mm-hmm. I caucus for Mike Huckabee. Okay. And I don't. I kind of like the flat tax idea. In, in the yeah, twenty three percent, whatever he had. I like that. So I read the book and I caucus for him. But out of the group, and I was in the government class my senior year, and they were, and the, all the teachers were hammering Bush every day. Everything's mm-hmm. Bush's fault. The world's falling apart because of President Bush. And no teacher, no child left behind. That was a huge thing. I remember that. Talk about that every day, and I was. Which it was, Bush and Ted Kennedy. They always they yeah. always throw that part out. They don't, yeah. they don't mention that Ted Kennedy was involved. They they always yeah. blame Bush on that. But anyway, continue. Yeah, you're exactly right. And then I would get hammered and actually got in a lot of trouble when I was in high school for uh, speaking a pretty conservative mind mm-hmm. when I was 17, 16, <laughs> going there. I know this might surprise you a lot, Kevin, but I would say something like, "Jake, you can't say that." I'm like you. Just, don't let people, you know, they, they spew their opinion and they don't let you go, well, here's another, here's another point of view. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, you're too young to know. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, but, but like they would teach you something. It's more not like teaching or like when you value opinion, it's more like indoctrination, telling mm-hmm. people this, yeah. this is the right way to do it. This is the what, what, so on. But then I went to Iowa, which you know is the most liberal college, but I always voted back in, back home, back in Johnson. And I, I think I only voted there once, but also, so there, and that was just, Obama came there, I think. He came there probably Numerous six, times. six, seven times yeah. in six months, and he would just get every student out. The, oh, yeah. The get out to vote that year was absolutely unbelievable how he did that. But they, they don't even know. He would just talk to them on the points. They don't quite pay taxes yet. It's kind of like when I go back talk to my kids in high school, and I they lie to me on issues. It's never big issues. When I go door knock. It's property tax. Income tax are too much. But when I talk to them, it's kind of my driver's license at 14, you know, or something like that. But they don't pay taxes yet, so they don't quite – understand it. So it's a little bit different, but I think that as we move forward, Bush will not be portrayed as what he was then. It's getting a lot more model. It's kind of like when President Clinton comes back and helps out Obama mm-hmm. because you, you forget the bad things he did. You know, as time goes on, you mm-hmm. unless you follow like we follow it, you forget. So like, oh, I think times were good back then. It's always a nostalgia. Times were better back then. So I think it's kind of the way it's going to be. Yeah. Of course, we saw terrorism rear its ugly head again just recently in Boston. And, um, you know, one of the debates that's been going on kind of between the libertarian wing of the Republican Party and um, more mainstream conservatives and Republicans is there have been a lot of attacks and criticism of the Boston police saying, you know, they were forcing people from their homes at gunpoint and there was martial law in Boston, Representative Vanderland, what do you what do you think about it? I mean, here they are. They're looking for a terrorist that had already killed three people and injured 178 with bombs. They murdered a police officer, got into a shootout with cops, uh, badly wounded another. They were throwing bombs at cops, and here they're trying to find this guy. Uh, so they're going from house to house, and there's some people in the Republican Party, including in leadership of the Republican mm-hmm. Party of Iowa, saying. You know, this is unconstitutional what they're doing. Your thoughts? Yeah, I I think it's pretty hard to know all the details of what the Boston police were doing. Mm -hmm. But if I were involved with the Boston police and I had these two knuckleheads surrounded Mm -hmm. in whatever size area it was, I think I'd be inclined to do whatever it takes to Uh make sure I get them. And isn't that part of our (laughs) civic duty to comply with their request to, hey, 
let us come in and search your home just to make sure they're not hiding out in your basement. I can't imagine anybody actually living that close to the situation saying, no, I don't want you to come in. I mm -hmm. mean, like the guy that the guy finally turned up in a boat. Right. Some yeah. guy went out to smoke a cigarette or mm -hmm. something and just happened to see him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean. Well, and the thing is, is that I, I don't think anybody would be sitting there saying, well, I know that he's not in my house. You may not know that. Right. And, you know, if, if or, I mean, he, you know, I mean, he could have been holding people right. by gunpoint, yeah. you know, yeah, or just I, to have somebody come in and say, and certify right. that, well, he's not in your house. I kind of yeah. I think I would appreciate that if yeah. I was living there. Yeah. Jake, your thoughts on, on this <clears> topic. You know, I don't know all the details either. Actually, I know more details than I thought I was good because I've been out Facebook friends and I saw you ranting for a good eight or nine hours. And I was like, oh, thanks, Kevin, for keeping the post. Not I kept reading the articles. And so, yeah, besides that is, I, I don't, if, if they were fortunately doing it, yes, there's a problem. But if it came, a cop came to my door and he's like, oh, can we search your home? I'd be like, yeah, that's no problem whatsoever. Yeah, but some of these rumors about gun points, there's no way that's true. About well, yeah. I mean, there, there is a video and, and they were, you know, banging on doors loudly. Mm -hmm. and, and they're, I mean, they had, you know, full SWAT gear and all that. And they were outside with guns and they were, you know, they were telling people, come out of the house, go down the street, let us, you know, search you, make sure you're not carrying a bomb, whatever. I mean, if you look at, there's, there's one video, one video um, like that. And, and it's, um, you know, we don't know the full context. It doesn't mm -hmm. look real good when you watch the video, <laughs> but it looks like they were banging on that door for a long time. And, you know, you have to wonder, and then like five people slowly come out of the house. So you have to wonder what yeah. were these five people doing? But, you know, to me, and somebody made the point, well, I, you know, the founders must be turning in their graves to see what's going on here. And I'm like, okay, let's go back to colonial times. Let's say the British came in and, you know, attacked and killed mm -hmm. women and children and civilians. I'm pretty sure George Washington and Thomas Jefferson would be okay with going house to house to look for one of these guys if they were hiding yeah. out in the neighborhood. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I just, sometimes we get a little bit wrapped up in principles when there's a, a bona fide emergency going yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, let's let's look at the purpose behind the principles <laughs> that we have, that, that we're talking about. The purpose is that we don't want police officers just being able to wander into our how, homes and find things that we're doing that are, quote, illegal. Right. Because we because they just said, I'm going to come into your house. Now, if these guys had come into the house and said, we're trying to find this guy so that he doesn't kill anybody else, and then 20 minutes come out and say, look at all this marijuana we found, <laughs> you know, then I'd say, okay, right. that's th that stops. Yeah. That stops. But, the, yeah, that's not what they were doing. No. They were just making sure there, there right. was not a dangerous terrorist exactly. hiding out in exactly. your house. I, I just, you, you, can, you can conform to the principles and still do what needs to be done for the safety of the community. Absolutely. You were watching the Iowa legislative hour powered by webcast one live back with jake heifel and guy vander linden state representatives along with my co-host art smith in just a moment when the iowa legislative hour continues from the remax real estate concept studios this is webcast one live drink dance party Kitties is the ultimate dance club in Des Moines. A huge dance floor with room to move, three bars to keep your drinks full, and kicking DJs playing all your favorite dance music. At Kitties, we've always got your birthday party planned with Birthday Fridays. That's right, when your birthday rolls around, there's only one place to go. Gather up your friends and head to Kitties, where you drink free on the Friday of your birthday week. Find out more about Birthday Fridays at KittiesUSA.com. Kitties, all kinds of people, all kinds of music, all kinds of fun. Drug and alcohol addiction slowly steals a person's identity, tearing away pieces of their life little by little until one day it seems like the hope of a happy future is gone and there's no chance of getting it back. Here at St. Gregory Retreat Centers, we can assure you that there is hope. Our unique approach to recovery begins with the understanding that the dysfunction and damage caused by addiction can be overcome, not just dealt with. Don't let another day go by. Call St. Gregory today. Whether you're 10, 25, 50, 80 years old and beyond, everyone needs to live within their means. I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America. For almost a quarter of a century, we've helped people of all ages learn to manage their personal finances to benefit them far into the future. When problems arise, we've got the experience you need to make those debt problems go away. Got financial problems? Call Consumer Credit of America. 
If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. And welcome to the final segment of this week's edition of the Iowa Legislative Hour. Kevin Hall, along with Arch Smith, our guests this week, State Representative Jake Heifel from Johnston and General Guy Vanderlinden from <laughs> Oskaloosa. I uh, want to talk a little bit about elections because this is Iowa and it's mm-hmm. always election season in Iowa. That's right. <laughs> it's exactly right. That's right. Even, even though election day isn't, you know, for another year and nine months or whatever uh-huh. it is, uh-huh. uh, it's always election time yeah. in Iowa. And of course, you know, the big thing is the U.S. Senate race. Mm-hmm. The Democrats have their candidate. It's obvious Bruce Braley is going to yep. be their nominee. I, I don't even think anybody else will get in on the Democrat side. Um, if they do, they'll get slaughtered because yeah. Braley's, you know, the golden child as he has been for many years. But the Republican side, we still don't know who's going to get in. Um, the iowarepublican.com, the website I work for, uh, kind of had a, a power rankings today. And of course, yep. Steve King is at the top of the list. Everybody, you know, if he gets in, he'll obviously be the Republican nominee, or at least yes. most people think. So in fact, yeah. I doubt anybody else would, would run to run want to run against him. Uh, but it's looking more and more doubtful that he'll get in. Um, somebody who has emerged this week as a candidate, in fact, I spoke with her earlier today, Senator Joni Ernst, who you gentlemen work with up at the Capitol uh, from Red Oak in southwest Iowa, a fellow veteran mm-hmm. uh, as yourself. What do you think about Joni Ernst as a potential U.S. senator or well, Senate candidate? I haven't had... Uh a whole lot of exposure to the senator. Uh, we have been on a couple of committees together, and so and I've had some conversations with her. Mm-hmm. Um, she's nobody's dummy, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. And uh, and I think she might be a viable candidate. I think so too. I mean, she's she's very bright, uh, a military background, uh, comes mm-hmm. from a conservative district. She's you know a solid conservative. Uh, and I think, you know, it, having her in the race, I think it would make for an interesting primary. Of course, somebody else who's uh, who's basically said, if Steve King does not run, I'm getting in. And that's U.S. Attorney Matt Whitaker. Yep. Your thoughts on Matt? Um, I think that that Matt, you know, he's a he's a good um, I think he'd be a good candidate. I think he would he would take some positions that are that are going to be well received within the party. Mm-hmm. Um, Jake is a former Hawkeye football player. Too, there's that too. <laughs> <laughs> We're both hawks here. <laughs> I better not bring up my allegiance then. <laughs> um, Which is? Uh, I'm all Iowa State. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. You don't, you don't have to mumble it. Just blurt it out. Be <laughs> proud of it. We're proud of the Go Hawks. Uh, uh, I, I understand. I, I was understand. Um, at a fundraiser for, at Matt Whitaker's house, actually, for Mike Brown. Mm-hmm. Oh, last election season. As we talked about, it's always election season in Iowa, but we last election season – Great guy. He works mm-hmm. with uh, Representative Chris Hagen now, who's here yep. last week. Right. He's a, Chris is a good friend of mine, but Matt's a great guy. Met him more than once. He's been posting on Twitter and Facebook that he's ready. If he, if King doesn't run, he's going. And yep. if even if uh, Bill Northey run, runs, he's still going to run. Mm-hmm. And I think he can do a lot of good things because there hasn't been a lot of people from Central Iowa. It's always yeah. that could be, be kind of nice. Ask me from Central Iowa running. Yeah, I think Bill would be an awfully good senator. I, I'm not sure how well he would do election wise only because as much as he may be have visibility at the state level in his in his office at, at where he is now, I don't know that a lot of people really know a whole lot about him. And I'm, I'm hearing that it, it's looking doubtful that, yeah. that he'll get. It. I know there's yeah. been a lot of talk about him, yeah. but um, he's an awfully good guy, though. I oh, really, I, I really, great guy. I really think he would do a fantastic job. Secretary of State Matt Schultz That's is a, considering getting mm-hmm. in any any thoughts on on matt schultz oh. uh if you guys have, have dealt with him much at the capitol oh i love matt schultz great yeah. guy he comes since we're on state government uh he's actually the chair i'm the vice chair of state government we deal with matt schultz in their team a lot charlie smith and mm-hmm. and those guys come because all their bills have to come through state government so we deal with yeah. them a lot but i really like matt schultz i did a fundraiser we did a fundraiser for him oh that was a while ago but he's a He's going to be able, I don't think he's going to do it this year. I really don't think he's going to run. But hmm. as a person, I really like Matt. Great guy. His yep. staff's great. Helps us out. And his voter ID stuff, his approval was 80% almost. Yeah. 70, 72%. Yeah, something yeah. like that. 
General Van yeah, der Landen. Yeah, he also uh, won an election he wasn't supposed to win. That's right. Um, yeah. And that's kind of a nice quality. Yeah, yes, and, and as a statewide office at that. Right. Yeah. I, I think, you know, thinking back to that, and I worked on Governor Branstad's campaign, of the statewide candidates, I think, well, everybody knew Northy was going to get reelected, and everybody right. knew Vout was, but... Um, you know, of the three contenders yeah. between, you know, Schultz, Jameson and Brenna Finley, yep. Schultz got the least amount of publicity yep. and, and came up and surprised yep. everybody by defeating Michael. Yeah. Barra. And I think the fact is, is that he ran on one issue that really resonates with people in this state. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's really the key to, to how that worked out for him. And now he has, he's running. Well, if he stays in the secretary of state's office right. and runs again, a basically Obama's Iowa campaign manager is running against him. Yeah. Yeah. So a political, a, a yeah. career political operative yeah. wants to be, wants to be in charge of our elections. Yes. I'm <laughs> Somehow sorry, I have I a problem with that. shouldn't laugh about that. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised by that, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Uh, of course, Kim Reynolds, there was mm -hmm. lots of talk about the Lieutenant yeah. governor uh, running for this U S Senate seat. I personally never thought she was uh, seriously going to I, consider I, getting in. Yeah. Um, but she, you know, the, obviously there was tons of speculation in the media and she announced this week, um, she would not be running, mm -hmm. uh, which I think is another indication that governor Branstead is going to run again in 2014, which yep. if he completes that term would make him the longest serving governor in U S history. It, that wow. includes uh, pre-colonial times too. Yes. Remember they, they used to point him for life. <laughs> like literally they go, uh -huh. hey, you're governor till the day you die. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that's pretty cool stat. Yeah. <laughs> Your thoughts on, on another term with governor Brands and the leadership that he's provided, you know, after 12 years out of the office, coming back, knocking off an, an incumbent governor, which had not been done in many years and uh, the work he's done the last three years. Yeah. I, I very much admire the governor. Uh, I'm glad he's back. It's nice to have somebody in that office that sort of knows where the bodies are buried. Uh -huh. Uh, knows all the levers to pull. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a very, very effective governor and extremely popular. Mm -hmm. uh, I very much hope that he runs again. I will tell you something about Governor Branstead. No one loves being governor more than Governor Branstead. Mm -hmm. he, no one has shaken more hands in this state than Governor Branstead. Yeah. He is 100 miles an hour every day. He's 65, 66? Somewhere, yeah. 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 Somewhere he's even him. older than I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And he's, you know, I was born in the 90s, so he's a lot older than I am, but he yeah. runs laps around me. Yeah. First time I met him, he came, got up about six at the Capitol by seven. He was back in my district by seven o'clock, had not stopped. Him and the state trooper just go around. Mm -hmm. He comes to Johnston, the pioneer, all the time. He was like, his staff will shoot me a text. Hey, we're coming here at the forum. We'll talk at a forum. He'll answer questions publicly. Do you know what that does for a governor? If once you talk to a governor personally and you ask him questions at a mm -hmm. forum, come to my forum or come to Pioneer or John yeah. Deere, or High V, for example, that's it. You're, you're going to vote for him forever. He mm -hmm. took the time to come to your district and talk to you and vote for you. He loves what he does. And one person that could make, will make it close if he runs is Vilsack. Right. Besides that, yeah. he will smoke anybody, mm -hmm. probably 55, 58%. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, just go, going off what you said, I can tell you, you know, on the campaign, going to these small communities out in, you know, extreme Northwest Iowa or Southwest Iowa, wherever it might be, there were so many times people said to him, thank you for coming here. Mm -hmm. Cause yeah. we haven't had a governor come here in four years yeah. since Chet Culver first ran for the office. He got an office and did not tour these these communities hardly at all, if no. ever. He he didn't go out and breach out yeah. into the area, and that's part of why you know he got his tail yeah. kicked in, in November two thousand ten. But you're right, Governor Branstad yeah. is a tireless, not only yeah. campaigner but tireless worker. Oh, absolutely. I, the other thing that I notice about the governor is that he really seems to listen to people, even if he doesn't agree with mm -hmm. what's being said. And I think for any politician, and and you guys can take notes if you want. Um, <laughs> if, are, if if you disagree with me. But you listen to what I say and can and can and can adequately communicate what I've said in your response. I'm more likely to engage with you and possibly at some point even vote for you, uh, even if we disagree on some things that that may be important to me. And I think that's that's a quality that we've lost in a lot of our politicians. I know that um, you know I, I occasionally will contact um, Senator. Uh, Harkin's office and Senator Grassley's office if I see something that I think I want to express my opinion about. And um, 
I'm not going to go into what happens with Grassley's office because usually we're on the same page anyway. But um, when, when I, it seems like any time I contact Harkin's office and I end up with a staffer, the conversation goes something like this. On issues such and such on, on this bill, my opinion about this, and I'd like you to convey it to the senator, is such and such. And the response almost always is, well, let me explain why you don't understand what you're talking about. <laughs> and I just find it terribly arrogant for a staffer, let alone the politician themselves, to take an approach. I mean, obviously, their staff has been trained to take this approach. Explain to our constituents what, why we are going in the direction we're going. That's, that's their mission is to convince me to change my mind, not to listen to what I have to say as a constituent. And, and I, I just, I just find that very aggravating. So I loved it last year. Harkin had a couple of staffers that he set on around the state and they promoted it as Harkin's staff would be doing a 99 County tour. <laughs> <laughs> not Harkin, nice. not, not Bahama Tommy, nice. Who, who rarely comes back to Iowa, yeah. but his staff up here, I don't know if they made it to all 99 counties, but that's how they promoted yeah. it. His staff was, yeah. I mean. He still lives in Iowa? Is he, make sure he still lives there? That, Do you have an address no. here? I just, I couldn't believe they would even publicly admit that. Ooh, yeah. a yeah. couple of flunky staffers are going to go around. <laughs> yeah. You know, when you have Senator Grassley, who's probably already halfway done or more with his 99 county tour right governor brandstead lieutenant governor reynolds going yep. all 99 counties yep. every single year yep. and that's how you do things yep. um Absolutely. You know, and I, i'm sure jake i know you um take part in in the voter forums in your community do, have you been oh, doing yeah yeah we have one in oskaloosa that's every two weeks and mm -hmm. i i consider it the best attended in the state there's usually a hundred or more people there wow which is Pretty that's, impressive. That's a lot, and because I've I've gone to quite a few of them <laughs> this year, or you know, around different areas of the state, and do not see crowds of a hundred. I see, you know, maybe forty. It may be the most that yeah. I see. What are your constituents asking you about? Oh, they run the gamut. Uh, the The big ones are always education and taxes uh, mm -hmm. in all forms. Uh, those those always rise to the surface, and then whatever the uh, issue du jour is, uh, but. The, the uh, you those things are difficult, especially when I was a freshman. I found them difficult because they knew more about the issues than I did. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. And you kind of get that deer in the headlights <laughs> yeah. feeling, mm -hmm. you know. But but it's good for it's good for politicians because it forces you to learn the issue, mm -hmm. to be ready yep. with an answer, and uh, and to think about just mm -hmm. oh maybe maybe that's more important than I thought. So. And these are people who, in large part, they, they come armed with their pet projects. They might yep. be, you know, a superintendent or, you know, heavily involved in, you know, parks and streams and that sort of thing. So yep. everybody has their own particular issue and they demand, you know, as much or more about it uh, yeah. as they do. And they even sit at the conservation table and the farm table and the <laughs> educator. Really? <table>. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you one thing is that I've always prided myself in is I've responded to everybody. Mm -hmm. I have responded to absolutely every email. It, sometimes I get the generic ones. They're not in my district. I don't respond to those. But if they're in my district, they let me know they're there. I will respond to you. I will call you back. I get phone calls. You could imagine. I always call them back. And I'll tell you one thing. That's what it takes. The thank you get for just saying, here, I took the time out of my day to call you. You can call me whatever. They have my cell phone number. If you can't if you can't get a hold of me, I think my cell phone number is on the Iowa website for legislator because mm -hmm. obviously I don't have my own phone because – Play for a century here. It's the only cell phone I have. So, <laughs> yeah. and, that, and that's the and that's the way it is. If you have to respond to them, always respond. If you don't agree, I will respond to. I do not support a Medicaid expansion, but I appreciate your position. Thank you for your concern. You know. Yeah. Politics for, uh, in Iowa is absolutely a hundred percent retail. Mm -hmm. yeah. and it's all forums, phone calls, knocking on doors, responding to emails. If you don't do that, I yeah. don't think you're going to get very far. I am astonished at your report on what Senator Harkin gets away with. No. Was, uh, it was, was surprising gonna, to me too. She's not right. running again either. The, yeah. last, <laughs> the last caucus, I, remember, I think it was CNN that had the guy said, he goes, they asked people, they go, well, what do you think about this can and this can? And they would say, well, I haven't met him yet. That's kind of the Iowa approach. That, yeah. yeah, It's like, if you haven't yeah. met him yet or he, he or she, it's, well. Don't nothing, have an opinion. Uh, yeah, I don't yeah. have an opinion yet. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, gentlemen, thanks for coming in this week. This has yeah. been a fun discussion. Has. I appreciate the opportunity. This has been fun. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Glad to have Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Jake Heifel and Guy Vanderlinden, state representatives. Art, 
Great to be with you again this week. Same with me. I'm looking forward to next week. That's it for this week's edition of the Iowa Legislative Hour. Have a great weekend.